get started here. My name is Russell Hughes. I work for Sunset Learning. Uh, it's one of our Sunset Learning Tech Talks, and today we're going to go through, or at least in this session, we're going to go through and discuss the explaining wireless fundamentals. Uh, this is part of the CCNA that they've got, the newer CCNA, one of the sections that they expect to be the self-study section. So we're trying to help you guys out a little bit, get some of your self-study done. All right, so we're going to go ahead and just get started here. And the first thing we discuss when we start explaining the uh, wireless fundamentals, really, where is it going to be used? Right? So we're going to discuss a couple different types of wireless access that we have available for us. We will deal with wireless access points that might be what they call a standalone access point or an autonomous access point, meaning the idea that you've got to go through and configure each and every single individual access point. And then we also will deal with what they can help and consider to be a, a this controller-based system that we use, where we're using a wireless LAN controller. Now, wireless LAN controller is where we do all of that uh, configuration of our wireless access points, essentially. Right? And the idea in that case is that when we go through and we set this up and we, we configure everything, our SSIDs that we want to allow people to connect to, what kind of security we have, that's all done here at the wireless access point. Excuse me. Uh, essentially, what that happens then is it pushes that outbound to all of the different access points that that wireless access controller is going to be controlling at this point. Okay. So you're going to see that they use what they call a cat lap tunnel back and forth between the wireless access point and the wireless LAN controller to be able to get data back and forth through these networks. And they mention a few different things as far as the different types of WAN technologies that we have available for us. One of those is what they call a wireless personal area network or a PAN. Think things like Bluetooth would be a perfect example of something like that. Uh, the idea is that we're, we're close to the devices themselves, really no more than around 10 meters away for the most part. So pretty close uh, to our local person that we have. They might have a wireless hotspot that you run on your telephone that we can utilize. Then we have wireless LAN connectivity. Wireless lands up to 100 meters. Again, some, uh, very similar to the idea of the concept of uh, an Ethernet cable, how long that Ethernet cable can be. I, but for the most part, you see, as you get further and further away from the wireless access points, you get slower and slower speeds that we have available for us as well. And then last but not least, we have a wireless metro area network that we have. As this allows me to get to, uh, think wireless to a service provider that we might potentially use. Okay. So there are wireless access points that we can utilize for that. And this year we can go through and create what they call an ad hoc wireless network. I'm going through and setting it up essentially like think from PC to PC connectivity that we have available for us. It creates what they call an independent basic service set that somebody can connect to. What this allows for is that I could have one of my PCs out over here set up and connect it to the wired network to some switch that's out over here. And it allows this user, this other user out over here, to be able to connect via wireless to my laptop and be able to use my wired connection if we needed to. Okay. Again, it exists between two wireless devices to communicate, contains a limited number of devices because of our collision domains. Now, the idea is that in this wireless access point, somewhat similar to a hub, wireless access points use what they call CSMA slash CA. Okay, so carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance. So rather than collision detection like a hub would use, the idea is that we're using ready to send, clear to send signaling to be able to determine which device can actually send data. And I just round robin the different devices that are connected to that access point. Okay, you're, you're clear to send, go ahead and send some data. You're clear to send, go ahead and send some data. You're clear to send, go ahead and send some data. So typically used in a small type of environment, usually when you want to do things like file transfer between the two different devices is where you're going to see that. We have Wi-Fi Direct. Wi-Fi Direct can be used for things like synchronization of your cell phone to your computer. Uh, you think of things like Apple TV and Fire TV that use that. Uh, the idea is that I'm connecting to that device so that we can play uh, information. Essentially, what you're really doing is you're making sure that your TV can connect to your PC so that we can display what we've got on the PC. Uh, you might see it on printers. I use it at my ha house all the time for my printer. It's a wireless, you know, directly to the printer itself. And it can also be used for file sharing to different devices. I mentioned in an infrastructure mode, the idea is now we have an access point that is connected to a wired network. 
Uh, so the idea is we've got a wired connection up onto the rest of the network and using wireless to give service to these users as if they were plugged into the actual switch. We will create what they call a basic service area. Basic service area is also known as a wireless cell. Now that service area is all based off of what they call an isotropic uh, uh, antennas, okay? So if you think about an isotropic antenna, the idea is that it is a perfect sphere of coverage that we have. Right? Imagine a perfectly round balloon that we've got available for us, right? Both above the axis point, below the axis point, to the left, to the right, and 360 degrees, okay? And so one of the things you look for within that wireless sphere is the idea that we can extend it to go further away from the access point. But again, if you think about the idea of that balloon, I'm taking a balloon, which is in, a, in this case, a perfect circle, perfect sphere of a balloon. If I wanna expand that to the left and the right, what you have to do is to push on the top and push on the bottom, okay? Well, what's that gonna do to that balloon if you think about the coverage of that balloon? Right? When I push, it's going to go through and extend the sides out, but there's a spot in the middle here where we're pushing down and we're pushing up out over here. So that means we get less of a coverage on top and bottom of the access point when we get to that device. Okay? So we get more coverage left and right, essentially, but less coverage on top and bottom. So the all idea is based off of that isotropic antenna that's being used. One of the things that we're looking for in infrastructure mode is the availability to be able to have these access points so that you can roam. As I move from one wireless access point to another access point, I don't have to worry about going up through and getting a new uh, IP address. That IP address is still usable. I, I don't have to go through and do another DHCP request. I don't have to flush out my ARP information that we're utilizing. <clears throat> so the idea is that both of these access points have the same wireless cell, essentially the same SSID on each one of these wireless access points with the same configuration as far as security settings are concerned. So as I move and I get further away from one access point and closer to the other access point, I eventually then start to train myself to the other access point. Once I've trained to the other access point, I can send data through that network. Now when we do this, you're going to see that we've got different things that have to worry, we have to worry about. Each one of these wireless cells uses a specific radio frequency that we use to be able to connect to that wireless access point. And I need to make sure that the radio frequencies from access point number one do not overlap the radio frequencies from access point number two that we have available for us. So they utilize different channels. In the United States, there are three non-overlapping channels, channel number one, channel number six, and channel number 11, okay? And the idea being in this case is that what we're looking for is to make sure that nobody that's touching another access device, hang on one second, has the exact same frequency, okay? So if you think about the idea of having one floor of a network, for instance, and I've got multiple access points. I've got a wireless cell that's right here. I've got a wireless cell that's right here. I've got a wireless cell that's right here. One that's right here. One that's right here one in the middle that kind of connects to all of these guys, right? and another one here, another one here, and another one here, right? And these guys kind of overlap as well. What we're looking to do in this case is to make sure that we have none of the access points that have this overlap right here actually use the same channel. Because again, one of the problems that we're gonna have within there is that they've got overlapping frequencies for that radio signal. So one of the things that we can do, because we've only got three non-overlapping channels within our wireless spectrum that we have available for us, we might have channel number one being used at this access point. We have channel number six being used at this access point. So again, there's no overlap that we have available for us, in this case, between those two wireless frequencies. Now, over here on this wireless cell, it's not connected to the first wireless cell. So we can reuse channel ID number one right here. And again, when we look at this wireless cell down here, it, it's not overlapping with this wireless cell. So we can reuse channel number six. Here I can reuse channel number one. Here I can use channel number six. Here I can use channel number one. Here I can use channel number six. And then the one in the middle that's connected to almost all of these kind of overlaps everything. We make sure it uses its own wireless channel number, 
okay? So that it's not going to be overlapped back and forth between the different devices that we have. Now again, when we start looking into the idea of this being autonomous access points, each one has to be configured on its own, we have to go through and set up what channel is going to be used for each one of these access points. When we start dealing with the idea of a wireless LAN controller, they automatically figure out which ones of these wireless cells are overlapping and automatically set the channel ID so that they are not going to be using the same frequency. Okay? So it makes it quite a bit easier when we start talking about the idea of having that wireless LAN controller and why so many people look for that wireless LAN controller to be able to not only configure all of our devices, but to make sure that they don't overlap as well. They show each one of these guys will have what they call a service set identifier. Essentially, it is your wireless cell that we're sending out from. Right? We might have, in this case, a guest wireless network that people connect, connect to. And with that guest wireless network, maybe we only allow outbound access to the internet. And then we have things like they show, in this case, a voice wireless access point a network that we're utilizing. For all of our phones that we have, and your wireless phones that we're utilizing, and they need to be able to get to infrastructure like our call manager that we have available for us. And so we have different rules for those. Now, each one of these SSIDs is a different wireless frequency that we're utilizing out over here. However, when it goes onto the wired network, you're going to see that at that point in time, we have to deal with the idea that it's we're going to map this SSID to a VLAN so that we can keep our, our data separate on the wired network as well. They show as far as the centralized access uh, architecture that we have, a couple things we can do. They show the split, uh, split MAC brings these features. Split MAC essentially tells us what's going on within the different devices that are connected to the wireless access point. And when we deal with an autonomous access point, each one of our SSIDs are directly mapped to a VLAN on the wired network. So this link from our access point out onto the wired environment has to be a trunk link right here. And it needs to carry multiple type of traffic. I need to carry the management VLAN so that I can tell that or SSH in an access point and make changes to that device. I need to, in this case then, also carry the two VLANs that are mapping to our two SSIDs that we have on the access point. So in this case, the data VLAN and the voice VLAN also have to be carried across that trunk port. When we deal with the idea of using a wireless LAN controller, we have what they call a cap wap tunnel in between the access point and the wireless LAN controller that's being used. And that is cap, cap wap tunnel is a standardized protocol that we use to be able to configure these access points. And the idea in this case right here is that it doesn't matter which SSID it comes inbound from, it all goes across the cap lap tunnel to the wireless LAN controller. Then the wireless LAN controller goes through and decides which SSID is that user connected to and determines to send it out to the wireless network based off of its wired VLAN. Okay. This came in from a user that's on the data VLAN. I need to send that out the data VLAN on that trunk link. So the link between the wireless LAN controller and the switch is now an 802.1Q trunk link. The link between the access point, like if you had a switch in the middle right here, this link between the access point and that switch would typically be an access VLAN. And the only VLAN allowed across that would be the VLAN that we used for this cap lap tunnel. Okay. what we would call the access point VLAN. Now, you might also allow the, the management VLAN across that as well, but typically it's all going to be done on the wireless LAN controller that you do your management, right? And the wireless LAN controller will use that, that cap lap tunnel to be able to configure the access point itself. And they mentioned the idea of this cap lap tunnel. Configuration of protocol for wireless access points. And they show the idea is that it's a current industry standard that we're utilizing for managed data access points. It supports both IPv4 and IPv6. It uses the following. They show it. we've got two different things. There's a control plane. How do I configure the access point itself, which uses UDP port 5246. And then the data plane, the traffic that comes from the users on this access point that has to be sent out onto the wireless LAN controller. Uh, that's going to be used in the data plane on port number 5247. 
but all going across that same VLAN in this case. We mentioned the idea that when we go through and make configuration changes on the wireless LAN controller, what we're going to have to do is to create the SSIDs that we want for these access points to be able to advertise out under the different users. What can they connect to? Right, again, we're seeing that we've got a guest SSID in this case and an internal SSID right, for our own uh, staff. They show they need to isolate these two frames from each other on the cable because then they were separated in the wireless space. I, so as traffic comes through from these users, I'm coming inbound on two different wireless SSIDs coming inbound. I, remember, the access point is going to go through and send this via that CAPWAF tunnel to the wireless LAN controller. The wireless LAN controller says, all right, based off of the MAC address and the IP address that you've got, you're a part of the guest SSID. SSID. And so that has to go across this particular VLAN. So I'm going to have a guest VLAN that I typically have sent outbound to get to the rest of the network. And again, we might say, oh, that guest VLAN can only get outbound to the internet. However, if you're coming in from the internal SSID, again, I know your IP address and MAC address combination. And based off of that information, I'm going to say you go across the internal VLAN so you can reach devices that are on our internal network our local servers that we might be using, our call manager that we have available to be able to communicate with other hosts that are on that wired network. They show as far as the switch configuration, we're going to discuss what has to be supported back and forth between these to be able to go through and deal with this wireless LAN controller. And again, it depends on whether these are a, stand, a standalone access point. I wouldn't configure the access point without a wireless LAN controller. So I actually go into the console of this wireless access point and configure it manually. Or is it a centralized access point? Now we have an access point that uses a wireless LAN controller for its configuration. We mentioned when we start looking at the standalone access points, this link in between the access point and the switch is configured as an 802.1Q trunk link. And it needs to allow the management VLAN, so that we can access the access point and make changes to that access point via SSH. Okay? It also needs to allow all the data VLANs that we have. Remember, if we have multiple SSIDs that this access point is servicing, each one of those is mapped to a, wire, a, a VLAN on the wired network. So I need to allow all of those data VLANs across that link as well. Versus a centralized environment where we're using a wireless LAN controller. And now what we've got in a centralized environment is the link between the access point and the switch is an access port. And the only VLAN that's needed across that is that CAPWAP VLAN that we're going to use. There's a specific VLAN that's just for that configuration of CAPWAP. The link between the wireless LAN controller and the switch, a lot of times it's set up, notice how they're showing that it's a, a link aggregation group that's being used within here, an ether channel bundle. On the wireless LAN controller over here, we're configuring this as a trunk interface. And again, what do we need to configure? We need to allow the CAPWAP tunnel across there. We need to allow communication to the access point. We need to allow all the data VLANs cross out over here. Because as traffic comes inbound from these users, I'm on a certain SSID on this wireless access point. That gets tunneled through that CAPWAP tunnel to the wireless LAN controller. The wireless LAN controller now says, oh, that is this particular VLAN that we have on the wired network. So as we send that information out, it goes back out through this access point or this trunk link out over here on the wired network on its perspective VLAN based off of that SSID. So there are three types of different VLANs that require when we're dealing with this. There's the management VLAN. Again, how do we actually go through and get into that wireless LAN controller and make changes? There's the access point VLAN. I need to know how do we communicate and send that CAPWAP tunnel and information up onto the access point itself. And then the actual data VLANs. This is as I receive that user data coming through that CAPWAP tunnel, I need to then send it on the wired network on its perspective VLAN. So they show the configuration of this. And notice right here in this particular slide, they're dealing with the link between the wireless LAN controller and the switch. They've gone through and specified that as a switchboard mode trunk, assuming that's 802.1Q trunking by default. 
They've gone through and said, what VLANs are we going to allow through there? We're VLAN, uh, allowing three different VLANs, right? We said the management VLAN, the access point VLAN, and the data VLAN. So our management VLAN, in this case, 11. 12 would be the access point VLAN, and 14 would be what we're using for the data VLAN. Assuming, in this case, there's only one SSID out here at the access point, okay? Now, if there are multiple SSIDs, there'd be multiple data VLANs that have to be allowed across that trunk link. Now we're looking at the interface between the switch and the access point. So we're talking about this link out over here, which we said should be set up in this case as an access interface. And notice that the only thing that they're allowing across that is VLAN 12, the, uh, the CAPWAP tunnel essentially, okay? The access point VLAN, as they call it in the wireless LAN controller, okay? And that's how we manage that, uh, that access point that we have available for us. And they show that communication. As my traffic comes inbound from these users, it comes in via an SSID and a radio frequency. In this case, they're connected to the SID, SSID of Corp that we're utilizing. The access point sends that information via the CAPWAP tunnel. And I don't do a real great job of this, but this gets encapsulated in this CAPWAP tunnel and sent to the wireless LAN controller across that access point VLAN. The wireless LAN controller takes a look at the information. What's the IP address, the MAC address of this information, the SSID that they would they had joined to, and determines them what the data VLAN is that they're going to send that traffic out on. And so here you get to see that, oh, based off of you being a part of the Corp VLAN, we're going to send you across the Corp VLAN on the wired network. And that allows you to get to all the different resources on the rest of the network. Make sure that traffic is de-encapsulated, the SSID is mapped to this VLAN ID, VLAN 14. Again, part of the configuration on the wireless LAN controller. When I configure the SSID, I need to specify what the data VLAN is going to be, okay, the wired VLAN that we're utilizing. Make sure the wireless LAN controller tags that data with its VLAN ID, sends it out onto the switch. That's why it's an 802.1Q trunk link. I'm saying, hey, this is a part of VLAN 14 out of here, so the switch knows, yeah, VLAN 14 can go up onto the rest of the network. Now, if we wish, we could do things like routing from VLAN 14 to any other VLAN on our network if we wanted to. We have to set up some device that allows us to do that, because this is a layer 3 switch here, would allow us to do that right there on the local device. If we're dealing with an autonomous access point or a standalone access point, there is no wireless LAN controller. So I've actually gone into the access point now and I've configured it with what it needs to use for an SSID, what it's got for security on that SSID, and what VLAN is that SSID going to be mapped to on the wired network. So now the, everything happens at the access point. So we're considering this link in between the switch and the access point as being an 802.1Q trunk. Again, they've gone through and they're saying, I need to make this a trunk interface. They've made the native VLAN, VLAN 12. Okay, That is the access point VLAN that we're utilizing. So traffic to the access point itself is going to be across that native VLAN. That being said, remember that on a native VLAN, it has no 802.1Q trunk link. The other thing we need to allow is any of the data VLAN. So if I've got multiple SSIDs configured on this access point, there'll be multiple data VLANs that we've added within here. Okay? So notice that across their, their allowed trunks or their, their allowed VLANs, they're allowing both the access point VLAN for management purposes to the access point and any of the data VLANs that are mapped to the SSIDs that that, that access point is going to service. In this case, because it's a standalone device, everything's locally switched. No need to go outbound to a wireless LAN controller through that CAPWAP tunnel. As soon as we receive the traffic inbound to the user, I'm going to essentially make that an Ethernet frame that's on the data VLAN that we're utilizing across that trunk port. Okay. This allows us to do locally switched traffic on the access point. What I mean by that, locally switched traffic, let's just discuss that real quick. Let's say we got two people, and they're both connected to the SSID of Corp. Locally switched traffic allows that traffic to go directly to the access point and right back out to another user without having to go to the rest of the network. 
if we had a wireless LAN controller out over here, and this is then a cap lap tunnel between these guys, what you're going to see is that as my traffic goes from host to host in this SSID of Corp, by default, it has to go through the cap lap tunnel of the wireless LAN controller, and then back through the cap lap tunnel to be able to reach the other user. So quite a bit different of our, our flow of data, our logical topology is going to be changed quite a bit when we start talking about using that wireless access control. Now, they show we also have what they call work group bridges. And work group bridges essentially allow us to connect multiple devices through a wireless connection. Okay? So now notice that we don't have just one device connecting directly to the access point anymore. We got our wireless bridge is connected to the access point. And this has got a wired connection to a wired switch where we got multiple users hanging out on out over here. Right? And the idea provides connection to devices connected through those Ethernet ports. So these users are not joining the network via wireless out over here. They are a wired connection being used. Now they also have mesh networks. Mesh networks are sometimes uh, people call it man A. Okay? Man A would be the idea of using these mesh networks to connect multiple users together where not every single access point actually has a connection to the wired network. You see it a lot when you start dealing with things like uh, uh, open air campuses that we're dealing with. Uh, you start dealing with things like uh, 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 stadiums, baseball stadiums and football stadiums, a lot of mesh type of networks being used within here. And the idea in this case right here is that you've got an access point This guy right here, typically known as what they call the rooftop access point. And it's the one that has that connection to the wired network. The other access points then are trying to connect and find a way to be able to reach that rooftop and rooftop access point. So notice all these other mesh access points that we have available for us. And we might have multiple access points here. And this access point might have access to the, this guy and also access to this guy that's out over here. And allows users to be able to connect to this access point. This access point then finds what's the best path to reach the rooftop access point to get to the wired network that we have available for us. And so they show one access point radio is used to serve the clients. Notice here that they're using the 2.4 gigahertz access range that we're being used. And the second radio is used for that backhaul traffic this link between the wired network and the wired network, network to be able to reach the rooftop access point. They're using the five gigahertz range to make sure that it's completely non-overlapping radio frequency. Now, a lot of times now what we have to worry about is some type of routing protocol being used on these other access points to determine what is the best path to reach the mesh access point. We have things that we can utilize like uh, uh, routing protocols for low power lossy networks that take into account things like signal strength, signal to noise ratio. Is it better to go directly here to get to the rooftop access point? Or maybe there's some big obstacle in between these two access points. And maybe the best access would be going in this direction to be able to get to the rooftop access point. Okay. So they're using a routing protocol that takes into account things like that wireless signal that we have available for us and what's the best path to get to that rooftop access point. And we mentioned the idea of these Wi-Fi channels that we have available for us. They're different frequencies. When they originally came out, they came out with a standard known as 802.11. 802.11 used a 2.4 gigahertz range. And they'll show they have data rates. Again, remember I said the further away you get from an access point, the slower your rates become as far as speed to the access point. So in the original 802.11 standard, there were two data ranges. So if I had an access point sitting out over here, you'll have a spot around it that would get you up to two megs of uh, bandwidth. Right? And then as you get further away from the access point, you slow down to one meg. Okay? And they show the only two data rates that we have available for us in that case. Then it came out with 802.11a. 802.11a uses a different radio frequency range, the 5 gigahertz range. One of the big problems that people don't like about the 2.4 gigahertz range is that 
there are a lot of other devices that use that same range. Right? Microwave ovens use that same range. There are a lot of uh, uh, things like, uh, uh, I'm thinking like remote controls that use that. Uh, if you remember the old wireless phones, right? not a cell phone or a landline wireless phone that that uses those 2.4 gigahertz ranges as well. Right? So Ender 2.11a was just trying to say, let's get into a range of frequencies that are A, going to allow for higher speeds, and B, don't have nearly as many devices that are utilizing that same wireless range. Notice it also goes through and gives us more bandwidth within here. Okay? So the same kind of concept in 802.11a. Right? As you're close to the access point, you can get up to 54 megs per second. As you get further away, it goes down to 48 megs, then to 36, then to 24, then to 18, then to 12, then to 9, then to 6. And if you go past that, no access anymore. Again, one of the big problems with this is that within 802.11a, the equipment at the time was more expensive because it was in this five gigahertz range, which really meant that they had to try to create access information and a wireless configuration that's not used by a lot of other devices. So it was much more expensive. So people went then to 802.11b. 802.11b essentially said, let's use that same 2.4 gigahertz range but give us faster speeds through that network. And now we get four different data rates, 11 megs and 5.5 megs and two megs and one meg. They eventually then came out with 802.11g. 802.11g still uses the 2.4 gigahertz range, but has faster speeds available for it. So it's cheaper because it uses those, those 2.4 gigahertz range, but again, gives us faster speeds than 802.11b. They eventually came up with 802.11n, and 802.11n typically uses both frequencies, both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range, to get us faster speeds that can send through both of those frequencies available for us. And they show you can get up to 600 megs per second through that link. And last but not least, now they have 802.11ac, which uses the 5 gigahertz range. Typically, this is more for like a, a access to things like a wireless service provider. Okay? rather than at an access point, and they show it can give you up to three and a half gigs. They show there are available channels for Wi-Fi in the 2.4 gigahertz range. They go from 2.4 to 2.4835 as far as our gigahertz are concerned. Okay? Now, in Japan, they've expanded that to 2.497. This allows for Japan to have an extra channel that's non-overlapping, -over is essentially what they're looking for. And they show, as far as the available channels, in the United States, we have 11 channels. In Europe, they have 13 channels, and in Japan, they have 14 channels. But even with those 11 channels in the United States, there are really only three that do not have overlapping frequencies. Okay. The 5 gigahertz range is Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure, or UNNI. And it's subdivided into four different ranges. Range one is from 5.15 to 5.25. Range two from 5.25 to 5.35. Range two extended is from 5.47 to 5.725 gigahertz. And then last but not least, range three goes from 5.725 to 5.825 gigahertz. Okay. Like I said, it overlaps. We've got another range called ISM band that they utilize as well and it overlaps with what they have for a UNI-3. They show those bands are divided into different channels where each access point has one channel for its operation, a specific gigahertz frequency being used. Right? And again, you got to think about the exact same thing like any kind of radio system that you're looking for, right? FM or AM radio. We've got different bands. I, I am 98.2 right? or 98.7. They don't overlap as far as the radio frequency, so we don't hear two different channels at the exact same time. Okay? They show these overlapping channels can cause things like interference and adjacent channel interference, where we all of a sudden don't necessarily know where we're sending data. I might say one frame through one access point and another frame through another access point causes all sorts of problems, pacing information, multiple frame copies. So we want to make sure that we use a non-overlapping channel. And they're showing us the different channels that are available for us in that 2.4 gigahertz range. So notice channel number one that we have available 
has a specific range from 2.402 to 2.4025 or something like that that they've got available for us. But notice channel number two out over here overlaps with channel number one. There's a bunch of frequencies in over here that overlap for channel number one. And so does channel number three and channel number four and channel number five. It's not until we get to channel number six that all of a sudden we have a frequency range that does not overlap what we've got in channel number one. And if we look at all the other channels, again, you not only have channel number three, four, and five that overlap channel number six, but also channel number seven, channel number eight, channel number nine, and channel number 10 all overlap that channel number six. Not until we get to channel number 11 that now all of a sudden we have a new channel that does not overlap with channel number six. And we said in Europe they have up to 13 channels that they utilize that are open for, uh, for use in wireless, but it's still, even channel number 12 and 13 still overlap channel number 11. And we said Japan has gone through and expanded that frequency range to add in channel number 14. So they have in Japan one more channel that is non-overlapping. We mentioned these access points. If their wireless cells overlap with each other, we're going to make sure that the two wireless access points do not use uh, uh, channel numbers that are going to have overlapping frequencies. Causes all sorts of problems. And they show the 5 gigahertz spectrum. Again, we have the UNII standards that are being used, which are subdivided into four different groups. Let me show some advantages and disadvantages of both of them. That four gigahertz spectrum has a greater range for the spectrum, better propagation, meaning that they've got, uh, it's cheaper. There are a lot more people that actually create devices that support the 2.4 gigahertz range, especially when wireless first started, okay? Disadvantages, there's more interference, okay? It's not just Wi-Fi that utilizes these same frequencies. We got. We mentioned things like uh, uh, wireless phones, uh, microwave ovens use that frequency, right? There's some uh, uh, remote controls that use that same frequency. And there are only certain number of channels that don't overlap. And the five gigahertz spectrum, but much less crowded spectrum, because again, what you see within here is that that range tends to be more expensive to make the equipment. So you have a lot less of devices that are competing for those same, uh, those same three channels that are available. We have more non-overlapping channels in the five gigahertz spectrum. However, because it's more expensive, you see fewer and fewer devices that support the propagation of five gigs. And they show older devices typically don't support it at all, just simply because they don't have that radio spectrum. And they show other non 802.11 radio interferers. We mentioned microwave ovens, motion detectors, wireless headphones, game controllers use it, fluorescent lights, wireless video cameras, remote controls. I, uh, like I said, uh, you see a lot of them that are now going through and utilizing well, the, the old uh, uh, cordless uh, telephones use the same frequency range. So there are a lot of devices that have that overlapping information. We have issues uh, here, as a matter of fact, uh, we've got our, right outside the door right here, we've got a spot where there's kind of a, you can get donuts and coffee and stuff like that. Our wireless access point is right there in that little break area, right? So when someone uses the, uh, the microwave oven, it causes all sorts of problems within our wireless access point on this side of our building, okay? Now, not huge problems, but there are problems. It gets slower is essentially what happens within there. Now, we typically use DHCP, so when these users connect to the wireless network, we're eventually then going to go up on the wireless LAN controller to have it assign us an IP address, submit mask, default gateway information, DNS server, right? and a DNS server allows for us to be able to go through and do name lookup. Right? Most people aren't going to know the IP address for Cisco.com, so what we're going to do is we're going to put in our browser out of here, and I want to type in... Uh, uh, www.cisco.com, okay? Our DHCP server assigns us our IP address along with a DNS server. Once I know who the DNS server is, I make a request up under the DNS server. Who is www.cisco.com? It goes through and does a recursive lookup to find out the IP address for cisco.com and responds back to us. Now, 
because all of this information typically is going to have something to do with things like authentication, I want to know who these users are before I allow them to connect to our network. We might be using things like digital certificates. Well, in a digital certificate, you have a time of when that digital certificate was actually issued to you and when does it expire. So it's very important to make sure everyone has accurate time so that they know a valid certificate is actually a valid certificate. If my time is off, I might see a valid certificate as already being expired or not yet issued. Okay? So I'm not going to accept that digital certificate. Not to mention things like log files that we have available for us. We want to make sure all of those have an accurate timestamp on it. So we want to make sure that we're going through and setting up an NTP server to have all these devices synchronized off the same device as far as what they got for time. I want to make sure I know who these users are. So we're typically going to use something like a AAA server. AAA stands for Authentication Authorization Account. I want to know who you are. And now that I know who you are, I want to know what you can do. And now that I know who you are and what you can do, what did you do while you're logged into the network? And that's what a AAA server is going to do. Give me a username and password. Based off of that username and password, here's everything that that user is supposed to do. And then based off of that authorization, the idea would be what did they do on the network? And I want to keep track of that as far as logging is concerned. For our management protocols, this showing you in this case right here, the connection to the wireless access point. Our wireless access point has a GUI interface, is a wireless LAN controller, excuse me. Uh, so the wireless LAN controller allows us to go under management over here. I can go under uh, the SNMP information and set up an SNMP server, simple network management protocol. It allows us to give things like our uh, our community string that we're utilizing, our location, who to contact if something should, uh, should change, right? what port number are we going to use to communicate to that uh, SNMP manager. We said all of our wireless, line, uh, wireless access points also have a command line interface, so does a wireless LAN controller as well. Right? Now, it allows you to both do telnet and SSH device to it. Typically, most people, especially in the wireless LAN controller, only use it when they're connecting to the very begin with. Right? The idea is I'm going to connect to the console port, and I'm going to assign to it an IP address, subnet mask, and a default gateway. Now that we've got all that information set up, now I can go through and SSH to that device or configure that via the GUI interface. And come up with our information about all of our different labs that they do. These are just the different labs that they do in the CCNA for these wireless access points that we have available for us, setting up all the different things that they're going to do for you. Okay. So other than that, it's kind of what I have for you guys for this hour. Are there any questions out there? Unmuted and ask uh, me a question. Yes, sir. Uh, are, are there slides available that uh, I can uh, obtain for this uh, lesson? So unfortunately, I cannot give you guys the slides. Even if I gave them to you, you guys wouldn't be able to read them. They're all digital rights managed. So I'm not going to be able to give out any slides, unfortunately. But okay, uh, you. if, if you've got the, the course material from the CCNA, it's all in the course material for the CCNA is it, as well. OK, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you, guys. Have a nice day.